afternoon. My name is Kate P. Holler. I'm the executive director of the Sanctuary for Independent Media. Thank you to those who are returning uh, to join us again, who have been here before, and welcome to those who are joining us here for the first time. I will keep my remarks very brief as we have a very packed schedule of uh, important, important folks to hear from. Um, I do want to offer a land acknowledgement. Uh, so the Sanctuary for Independent Media resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are indigenous peoples of the lands of New York. Despite being forced from their lands, today the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We honor this community past and present and are committed to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So thank you all for being a part of that today. And without further ado, I would like to introduce the president of the board, Eileen Javier. Hello, everyone. Today, um, I'm not sure if you know, but um, we're celebrating our hero. Um, in March, there was um, the, bloody, the Bloody Sunday, March 7th, in 1955, that there was a hero that we are basically borrowing the award that we go on to be giving to Dr. David Carpenter for fighting a Goliath. It's funny that your name is David, and we had the story of David and Goliath. And you, with the help of many people here, fought Monsanto, which is a Goliath. And we're here today honoring you because of your fight for the people that cannot fight, that are suffering for the hazards of pollutants and contaminants. So on behalf of everybody here, we thank you. And in the spirit of John Lewis, the original good troublemaker, I have to say, we have to remember, when you see something that is not right, not just, not fair, you have a moral obligation to say something, to do something, speak up, speak out, get in the way, get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. This event has been brought up because of, a spo of these sponsors, the Nature Lab, United University Professions, the Albany Chapter, Beyond Plastics, Clean Air Coalition of Greater Ravina, Quimans, Rensselaer Environmental Coalition, POS, Green Education and Legal Fund, On Cage, Environmental Advocates New York, River Keeper, NYPIRG, Lights Our Norlight, Healthy Schools Network, Community Advocates for a Sustainable Environment, Stop New York Fracked Gas Pipeline, Zero Waste Capital District, House of Tonic River Initiative Inc., and House of Tonic Environmental Action League Inc., Exenic Hookson. So remember, Today we're here because we are good troublemakers. And I'm gonna bring you the good troublemaker, Steve Pierce. Come over here. <laughs> okay, it's fantastic to see so many of my favorite people here in one room. Uh, it was uh, such a great opportunity to bring everyone together um, and uh, it's uh, fantastic it turned into a celebration because it was originally going to be an organizing meeting to put pressure on SUNY Albany to do the right thing. Uh, so somehow they staggered in that path uh, <laughs> thanks to the efforts of many of the people in the room. So it's uh, great to be here with all of you. Uh, I uh, have known uh, Judith Hank for years, ever since I moved into the area, and I'm sure uh, most of you know her very well as well, uh, uh, too. Um, she's uh, been an environmental organizing dynamo from the first days of the first bottle bill, uh, and I can't even count her trajectory. For, I knew her, I think she was at Nyberg, and then went on to many, many great things, including advising the governor and uh, 
uh, I don't know how she uh, got into the EPA. Uh, it seems like a good idea to have environmental <laughs> activists in the EPA, but not as normal as it should be. Um, so uh, it's just really a, a great pleasure to invite uh, Judith Hank up on stage. Hey everyone, that is such a great line. How did she get into the EPA? Hmm. And I didn't get fired. It's amazing. And I loved working at the Obama EPA where science mattered and we listened to the public and environmental justice was a priority and we really, really need more of that. It is impossible to thank everyone who worked on this initiative. And um, we're gonna hear from a few people today, but. I just want to kind of bring you through how this unfolded in really just three weeks, because there will be ever other moments, hopefully not involving David Carpenter, where we have to do this again. So some of you recall Sunday, February 5th, front page of the Albany Times Union. This is how we learned about what was going on with our beloved Dr. Carpenter. So this was February 6th, where we learned that David was put on alternate assignment status, whatever that means. And then two days later, February 8th, we had our first organizing meeting on Zoom, of course. 35 people showed up, huge reservoirs of support. That first Zoom meeting was impossible to keep on schedule because everyone kept wanting to talk about how David helped him in their community. One Zoom led to another. Every meeting got bigger and bigger. More people started doing work. All of you in this room made phone calls to SUNY. They were really happy to hear from us. Um, a bunch of you did letters to the editor that got published. Patty Wood and, and Doug Wood, who couldn't be here today with Grassroots Environmental, set up a great website that is still up called supportdavidcarpenter.org if you want to read more. It includes an online petition. You don't need to sign it anymore. This great SUNY students um, set up social media. Uh, we had Zoom meetings with state legislators. and. I did happen to bump into the SUNY Chancellor uh, King at the um, Legislative Office Building and had you know, a very polite and productive conversation and told him you know, this was unacceptable and we're gonna keep going until this is resolved. And it was all of you in this room who kept going. Um, this, I, I wanna, for people who are not hanging on every word of the story, I just wanna summarize what happened is Dr. David Carpenter is an international expert on PCBs, which is primarily manufactured by Monsanto. And he's an expert on many environmental health issues. And he's working away at SUNY Albany, mentoring students, uh, teaching classes. And then this little mom and pop company, Monsanto, <laughs> submitted a couple freedom of information requests to SUNY Albany. And what should have happened is SUNY Albany should have answered the freedom of information request. This happens every day at state facilities, and that would have been the end of it. But instead, SUNY Albany um, uh, got very hesitant and for no really good reason put Dr. Carpenter on leave, uh, not explaining really to him what the problem was. Thankfully. Um, this eventually made its, its way through the process, but what I think really happened here is Monsanto set a trap and SUNY Albany walked into it. And the, the people who suffered the most are David's students, and we will hear from David today about how this all uh, went down. I do wanna um, introduce, uh, just to make him feel uncomfortable, um, Robert Schofield is here. He was David's attorney. Round of applause for the lawyers. <laughs> and there was also legal services provided by PEER, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. And 
I'm guessing you didn't know what we were going to do, but no one told us not to do it. So um, we just we just kept going and making this a very public um, debate because it needed to be. Um, so I want to just briefly call up various people who are working on issues and uh, played a key role here. And we're not going to get to everyone, but we really have to start by inviting Rebecca Martin from Riverkeeper up. You all know Riverkeeper. And what I want to tell you about Rebecca is I, I knew we could not pull this off without Rebecca. She is an incredible organizer, and she's really good at everything that you need to be good at these days, which is, you know, social media and technical support and things like that. What you don't know is, you know, we launched really fast, and I called Rebecca, and I didn't know she was on her way to Europe when I called her, but I really, because she's an amazing um, musician. She's one of these multi-talented people. I only do one thing, but she does music and arts and protects the Hudson River. So Rebecca joined our first Zoom at 1 a.m. from Europe, kept us organized, and then when she got back from Europe, she got really ill and just kept working. And she was the glue who got us the ability to get well over 2,000 prominent advocates, educators, scientists to send a letter to SUNY uh, to support David. So let me invite Rebecca up and also present Rebecca with these beautiful, beautiful, well-deserved flowers. The floor is yours. Maybe I'll take them home. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> I won't. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to have been a part of a large effort to uh, bring clarity and transparency to this issue, to the Monsanto Bear AG effort, to silence Dr. Carpenter. I mean, um, I'm just going to say a couple of small things here, just to, on behalf of Riverkeeper. Um, we're um, in the midst now, we're getting ready for this five year review on PCBs um, and are pressuring the EPA to, to establish this Lower Hudson Community Advisory Group, a CAG, in, in preparation. And so um, knowing this and knowing doing this work and hearing what was happening to Dr. Carpenter um, uh, and being able to work with Judith at any, any moment in time um, was a real pleasure for me and for Riverkeeper too to be a part um, of this effort. Um, it resolved within two weeks and we got the result that we wanted all of us together and, and for Dr. Carpenter to be reinstated um, and to be back with his students and to continue his important work as an expert witness and working with the Mohawk and doing all of the things that you do and being a great friend to Riverkeeper. Um, so in, in honor of Dr. Carpenter, where uh, Riverkeeper is giving him the Hudson Hero Award in June, on June 8th at Basketball. It's our annual event, and we're really excited to celebrate you, Dr. Carpenter, and your family. Um, and um, I'm just very happy to be here today at the Media Sanctuary, where I love to be with Steve and Branda and the whole community. Um, we made soup today, stone soup. Um, it's all vegetable, so it's ready for you all. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just Google stone soup. It's very cool. And Rebecca also came up very early from Kingston to, with Christine and Diana and others to make the stone soup. So let me welcome Pete Lopez to the stage for uh, two to three minutes. And Pete is um, with Scenic Hudson, another uh, champion of the Hudson River. Thank you, my friend. Good afternoon, everybody. And it's a pleasure uh, to be in community to celebrate 
Dr. Carpenter. So on behalf of Scenic Hudson, our president, Ned Sullivan, our board, our colleagues, we're, we're very appreciative of being here. I'd also like to thank my long-term, uh, long-time friend and colleague, uh, Judith, um, uh, for, for helping MC the event and for Riverkeeper, of course, our, our close partner on the Hudson. Uh, just a quick footnote, so Judith and I uh, began, we first crossed paths some 40 years ago. Now she's very youthful, but uh, uh, I was an intern um, and uh, Judith was the assistant director at the environmental planning lobby, uh, now environmental advocates. And um, that's where we marched on the bottle bill and uh, um, did all sorts of interesting engagements and uh, it, was, it was just a, a great uh, opportunity. Um, and ultimately both of us were able to serve uh, at EPA um, where we, we understood the importance of science and the rule of law uh, and very much uh, pers uh, personified in uh, doc Dr. Carpenter. So with that, I, I just want to say that um, for all of us here today, and, and we have so many other colleagues who were, couldn't be here with us today, um, groups who have unanimously singled their support for him, uh, for his courage and conviction. I um, also want to thank all our other groups who, who have added to this and amplified the message that Dr. Carpenter ha has sent uh, through his engagement. And, and through his perseverance and humility. As we celebrate him, and, and this is really a moment of reflection for all of us, because as we celebrate him, uh, we reaffirm our commitment to protecting public health and the environment, it gives us a chance to, to reinforce our core belief of playing, pay, placing science in the forefront and making sure that our actions are protective uh, and support our communities and the world around us. So the concept of science and the rule of law is deeply embedded uh, in our conversation and in our engagement. Until today, I not had the opportunity to meet him, uh, but I had uh, the opportunity to learn some things through readings and also talking to my colleagues, um, all of them inspired by, by your life of service, Dr. Carpenter. Um, through that process, I also took special note and interest uh, in your engagement with the Akwesasne, the St. Regis. And uh, through my work with EPA, I had a chance to, to meet uh, Chief Thompson and uh, Chief Beverly Cook, and enjoy the engagement with that community. And, and, and importantly, uh, what I found through that, and, and this, this is what I saw with Dr. Carpenter's engagement, a, a focus on air and, and land and the water around us. So Judith is at my shoulder. I, I've eaten up three minutes already. <laughs> Holy cow, I, I go into like a time warp. But, but I, I just, let me, let me just say that what I was impressed by was his emphasis on empowerment, um, self-determination, uh, strengthening communities. And I'll just leave you with a few phrases that uh, resonate uh, in my thoughts about Dr. Carpenter. Uh, our lives begin to end when we become silent about things that matter. Protect aid and comfort, the unfortunate and the oppressed. Uphold the rights of others while defending our own. Strive not to be a person of success but instead a person of value. And always leave a place better than how you found it. So Dr. Carpenter, I want to say thank you. God bless you. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So um, when words spread through the land um, that David was on alternate leave, whatever that is, I'm always going to say it that way. Um, we heard from so many community groups all over the country uh, about how David helped them at no cost to them, dropping everything and, and being of service. And one of the groups is Rensselaer Environmental Coalition. We're going to hear from uh, Robert Welton. If you wonder when you come down 90 and you see that growing mountain in the city of Rensselaer, that's the Dunn landfill right next to a K through 12 school. It's now the largest landfill for construction and demolition debris in the state, causing immense problems. And Little Rensselaer Environmental Coalition is leading the charge to get it shut down. That's the Dunn landfill. You see 1,100 students school next to it. That's it, I'm passing this around so you can take a closer look. So I wanted you to uh, hear 
what Dr. Carpenter said about the landfill, and I hope I don't blow out anybody's eardrums with this. Um, bear with me. The Dunn landfill poses significant threats to the health of the people in the whole greater community, including East Greenbush. It has particular harm to the children who are in the Rensselaer Public Schools. It's going to reduce their ability to learn, it's going to cause more asthma attacks. It's going to cause, in the future, more respiratory disease, more cancer. It must be closed. I see this as an urgent public health hazard, and I would totally support having the, the landfill closed yesterday. It certainly must not have the lease renewed next year. But this is a very serious hazard that everybody should take every action they can to uh, urge the powers that be to close it, and the sooner the better. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that's Dr. Carpenter. Um, he's always helped us with no hesitation every time we asked him for help. On his own time, juggling his schedule to be able to come and help us. Um, they say that a strong person speaks for him or herself, but a stronger person speaks for everybody, and that is Dr. Carpenter. Um, so. So the Rensselaer Coalition cares about kids. The coalition cares about a multi-billion dollar corporation essentially abusing the people in an environmental justice and disadvantaged community existing because of government failure and short-sightedness. Think about what you see and what you probably already know about this situation. It is a textbook case ripe for correction only because environmental justice has given us the opportunity to impose the renewal of the permit. There are 1,100 kids at risk from debris being dumped from eight states only a couple of hundred feet away from their playgrounds and athletic fields. Previous air quality tests have shown concerning levels of what is in the particular matter. Much more needs to be done by DEC and has been brought to their attention. This is true for the surrounding communities as well. There's only one way in and out of the landfill for the 60 ton diesel haulers that is through the residential and business areas of the environmental justice community. The quality of life, property values, and likely the health of the people is severely compromised. If DEC is committed to environmental justice, then here is their opportunity to show it. PFAS chemical tests are off the charts for the leachate that is going into the Hudson River untreated because sewage treatment only augments its structure. Millions of gallons a year are going into the Hudson. Many people in this room have helped us in various ways. We have also support from other national organizations, and thank you to all of you. Right now, we could definitely use a push. So please take our cards. They're in the back of the room on the table. Take them, take as many as you want. Um, I can get you more if you contact me. Um, we need involvement. We need legal and scientific help, and of course, the constant help like we have been getting from the media and particularly the sanctuary for independent media. This is a real story that would certainly bring national attention if there was some way to get it out. It's crying to be told. This big mistake is ripe for, ripe for correction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Excellent. Um, I wanted to mention um, Althea Malarkey with Scenic Hudson, who couldn't be here today, but who was on endless, endless emails and calls and Zooms, and it was fun. You know, we, um, we like the outcome, but I have to say working on this was actually a lot of fun because of all the people we were working with. Mostly women, just saying. Um, <laughs> So we, we had the state reserved as an organizing meeting, and it thankfully became a celebration. And there'll be a lot of cake, by the way. Wait till you see the cake. Um, but in the spirit of public engagement, I just want to mention two crucial events that are coming up and ask you to mark it on your calendar. Um, across the country, this Tuesday, there will be protests at banks urging banks to stop funding fossil fuels. 
Uh, this is led by Bill McKibben, Third Act, a bunch of groups. And there's actually gonna, there's over a hundred of these events and there'll be one in Albany, lucky us. So please join us this Tuesday at 12 noon at the corner of Broadway in downtown Albany and Maiden Lane. And we'll all walk together to three local banks um, and just say hi, please stop funding fossil fuel because it's literally killing us. Um, and if you need more information, Mark Dunley is in the back and he'd love to talk to you about this. Um, and also, um, please meet my colleague Alexis Goldsmith, also in the back. Many of you know Alexis from the sanctuary. Um, Alexis and I work at Beyond Plastics and a bunch of groups are doing um, a rally and lobby day to call on the legislature to cut packaging in half among other things. So we need your help. Uh, you're local, so you can, you can do this. This is on Tuesday, May 2nd at the New York State Capitol. We have flyers. Alexis has tons of information, so, so please come back and join us for that. If you read um, the Albany Times Union this morning, Chris Churchill, the columnist, had an excellent column about the ongoing problems at Norlight. If you haven't read it, uh, please go home and read it and share it with a thousand of your closest friends. And um, Churchill profiled what Ed Sokol and his family, living in Cohoes for over 50 years, have had to endure from Norlight, a very polluting hazardous waste incinerator. We're so happy to have Ed and his wife with us today. And um, speaking about Norlight will be Joe Ritchie, who is with Lights Out Norlight, recent graduate of Syracuse University. Come on up, Joe. Fan favorite. Three minutes. All right. I got my stopwatch here, so I don't get yelled at. Let's just have another round of applause for Dr. Carpenter here. So I know, maybe this goes up a little bit more. So I know a lot of you probably know me, but very quick, um, up until this year, uh, I lived at the Saratoga Sites Public Housing Complex in Cohoes, which is only feet away from the Norway Hazardous Waste Incinerator, where we've had to deal with black snow, dust on our cars, our windows, every time we clean it being black, every time we mop our floors, the Swiffer mops being black, um, it, it was quite scary. And in 2019, um, I got really involved with the Norlight issue when we learned that the AFFF was being burned at Norlight, which is a p harmful PFAS chemical that can cause cancer and a million other different diseases. And we were outraged. And one of the first people to step up and to help us was Dr. Carpenter. And he really amplified our voices and, and kind of validated our concerns because for decades, and Ed can attest to this, we were always told, oh, it's because you live next to a road. Oh, it's because you live next to the highway. That's why your snow is like that. It's not because of Norlight. Well, people like Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Walker, and everyone that's pretty much here really helped bring light to this issue. And, you know, residents who have lived there for decades now have hope that this facility can be closed. We were able to relocate 70 different families from Saratoga sites um, because of the work that Dr. Car Carpenter helped us with. So, I mean, this was something that people did not want to do, but we kept pressuring them and pressuring them and pressuring them. And it's sad to say, but there's going to be 70 families that will no longer be experiencing these hazards at Saratoga sites. Um, but that doesn't stop the issue. Uh, we still have a long road to go. The Attorney General is now investigating. Norlight has made some recent concessions, but we're gonna keep pushing. And we're gonna keep causing the good trouble that Dr. Carpenter has been causing for decades, and we're gonna continue this work because people really depend on it. And we really love to have friends like Dr. Carpenter to really help our, uh, our advocacy and to make our voices heard. Because if we didn't have people like him we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have had the victories at our, at our hand. Norlight wouldn't be hiring lawyers. They're now scared of us because of the work that Dr. Carpenter has been able to do for us. 
and my fellow friends here. So I want to say thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate what you've done for us, Dr. Carpenter. And uh, have a good day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe Ritchie. Very important voice. So the moment you've been waiting for. This is the Oscars. Of in, and we're so we're dr all dressed so beautifully. We should have had a little red carpet in paparazzi as we were coming in. So um, before I um, give you the more official um, biography of Dr. Carpenter, I want to introduce and thank his wife. Molly Cop Carpenter is here in the second row. Thank you. You, we know you can't do this alone, and I'm guessing um, that's a son and a daughter-in-law and a beautiful granddaughter. Thank you for coming. You must be very proud. So um, David is a medical doctor. He graduated from Harvard Medical School. He serves as the director of the Institute for Health and the Environment at SUNY Albany School of Public Health. He previously served as the director of the New York State Health uh, Department Major Lab, Wadsber Wadsworth Lab. He also in the past served as the dean of the Albany School of Public Health. He is an international expert on the health and ecological dangers posed by PCBs, pesticides, heavy metals. He's written more than 435 peer-reviewed publications, including books, I guess he just never sleeps. Um, he, I think his most treasured role is that of teacher and professor, and that's why the situation was so outrageous, because his students needed to, to learn from him, and that role was taken away. So this is the Good Trouble Award, um, in the inspired words of John Lewis, Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. So rather than pre presenting David with a boring plaque, we have this um, um, hammer. <laughs> and this was made by um, Melissa, um, designed it, and uh, it was made from leftover um, re reclaimed wood and metal, and it was made by Colin, no, Curtis, Curtis. They're not here, so I totally screwed that up, and don't tell them. Um, they, they stepped up. This, the, the hammer actually says, Making Good Trouble Award, Dr. David Carpenter, 2023, from the Nature Lab. So I guess your new name is David the Hammer Carpenter. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> I think I can sure. Yeah. Do you want to get water? Oh, thank you. I'll take the hammer. <laughs> well, here's a mic. Why don't you sit? We want to hear from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'll get into my thanks a little later, but this group probably doesn't need to have a lecture on PCBs, but you're going to get a brief one anyhow. <laughs> PCBs in the U.S. were made from 1929 till 1977, and they were useful for a variety of purposes. Uh, 99.9% .9 were made by the Monsanto Corporation at two sites in Sauk J, Illinois, and Anniston, Alabama. Now, uh, starting in the early 40s, it became clear that PCBs were escaping from their normal uses, and they were appearing in fish and in eagles and later in people and in many different places. Well, let me back up a little bit and say what they were used for. Well, the major use 
was for filling capacitors and transformers. PCBs are an oil. They're not very flammable. They're not very volatile or very water soluble, but they have some of those properties. So they were a good insulator. Uh, this is what happened at Fort Edward in Hudson Falls, New York, and in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where General Electric bought PCBs from Monsanto and filled capacitors and transformers. Now, unfortunately, they didn't always fill them without spilling them. And that's why the Hudson River and the Housatonic River are totally contaminated with PCBs. Now, other corporations, General Motors, Alcoa, Reynolds Metals, bought PCBs from Monsanto to use as hydraulic fluids in aluminum foundries along the St. Lawrence River. And the hydraulic fluids leaked, and they washed them down the drain into the St. Lawrence and its tributaries. And the Mohawk Nation of Akwesasne is immediately downstream from these sources. In addition, the Robert Moses Dam is upstream from there, and they used these transformers to capacitors, and they also leaked. Now, it isn't just the corporations that use uh, PCBs, because up until the early 70s, uh, Monsanto sold PCBs for open uses. These are uses where they were not enclosed anything. This was paint, oil-based paint, before 1972, didn't have mineral oil in it, it had PCBs. And some of those paints are still around. Ceiling tiles, floor finishing. For those of you old enough, the old car uh, carbonless copy paper, that was all PCBs. And when that was, had been used, what did people do? They burned it. Well, Monsanto demonstrated that PCBs are not destroyed by burning paper. What they do is volatilize and they spread all over the world. PCBs were the solvents used in caulk that surround windows and doors. And I will bet my bottom dollar it's in this church or this former church. In my office, outside the window, there was a, a hanging piece of caulk which we picked up and analyzed. 30% of it by weight was PCBs and that had been there for years but it slowly volatilizes off that caulk. Now, uh, the result of all of this is that PCBs are lipophilic, so they bioaccumulate in, in animal fats of all sorts. So if you put butter on your toast this morning, you got a bit of PCBs. If you drank whole milk, you got PCBs. Eggs have PCBs, all meats, but the worst the most exposed are usually fish from contaminated bodies of water, like the Hudson, like the St. Lawrence, like the Housatonic, like Chocoloca Creek in Alabama, which is the creek that runs from the Monsanto site. Now, since we all have PCBs in our body, what, what can we do about it? How can we avoid it? Well, the answer is pretty much, unless you're totally vegan, and don't breathe the air, you can't avoid it. So my question is, what are the health effects that arise from all of this? So uh, really, I think the, the more general question is, what can any of us do when there's an issue about a chemical that might or might not pose harm to human health? I want to list four things you can do. The first one is what I have spent most of my life doing, which is research. PCBs are in all of our bodies. Do they cause disease? Uh, you, you, first, you do studies in animals. And I spent m many years looking at the effects of PCBs in animals, particularly focusing on effects in the brain and behavior. And we found that PCBs in animals just like lead, reduce IQ. Reduce the indicators of IQ that you can test in animals. We then, uh, my colleagues went on to, uh, I should say that for, what, 40 years, I've had a research project, David Spink is here, he was part of our group, studying the effects of PCBs with the focus on the Akwesasne 
a Mohawk reservation in uh, northern New York State with parts of it in Quebec and Ontario along the St. Lawrence River. As I said, the aluminum foundries highly contaminated the water, contaminated the fish. The Mohawks are traditionally not only a fish-eating people, but a lot of their economic gains came from fishing. They are very highly contaminated with PCBs. Uh, the residents of Anniston, Alabama, primarily poor and black, primarily never employed by Monsanto at their plant, are highly exposed to PCBs from eating contaminated fish, from having PCB dust blown in their yard, getting on their garden vegetables. Uh, some of them had, I'll never forget some of my first experiences down there, uh, people had, had pigs that sort of ran any, anywhere, but then they were used for food. One day Monsanto came and bought all those pigs and took them away because they were so contaminated, they were concerned about liability. And the pigs just by rooting around uh, got exposed to PCBs. So the research that I and my colleagues done, and probably there's been more research on PCBs coming from the Albany area, not only from me and my group, than almost any other part of the world. I've already mentioned that PCBs harm brain and behavior. They reduce attention span, they reduce IQ, uh, they increase the risk of developing ADHD. Uh, they're very bad for the brain. PCBs are known human carcinogens. And it's not just the dioxin like PCBs, it's all PCBs are known human carcinogens. I served on the panel from the International Agency for Research on Cancer that gave that rating of proven human carcinogens to all PCBs. I did some studies around the Hudson River and other hazardous waste sites in New York State where we didn't have individual information. Uh, these are called ecologic studies. But we looked at the rates of hospitalization for a variety of diseases if people lived in a zip code that had a PCB contaminated hazardous waste site. The biggest number of hazardous waste sites were the both sides of the Hudson River from Hudson Falls down to Manhattan because the whole Hudson River is contaminated. What we found was elevated risk of diabetes, elevated risk of high blood pressure. Well, those are not diseases that most people, certainly not most physicians, think of as being caused by environmental exposures and certainly not PCBs. Well, ecologic studies have a lot of limitation because you don't have measurements of the chemicals you only know where people live. But we use those ecologic studies to then measure blood pressure in residents of Anniston, Alabama. Major fasting glucose and medical records for diabetes among the Mohawks at Akwesasne. And those studies confirmed our hypothesis that PCBs are a greater risk factor for high blood pressure than obesity, than race, then diet, then body, uh, uh, BMI, uh, body mass index. And when we went to the Mohawks, again, we found that the serum PCBs were a greater risk factor for, for diabetes or pre-diabetes than all of those other factors. So these are very nasty chemicals. They interfere with reproduction. The higher the PCB levels in both adolescent and adult Mohawks, the lower their serum testosterone, the male sex hormone. The higher the PCBs in women of, of reproductive age, the greater their menstrual irregularities. And in the highest levels of exposure, those women failed to ovulate. So creating infertility. Okay, so that's research. Now we've published hundreds of papers between my colleagues and me on the health effects of PCBs. What effect has this really had? Unfortunately, it has very little effect by itself. Our papers are published in the best scientific journals and only other scientists read them. So that doesn't really work. How else do you work? Well, government and government regulation. And I must say on the issue of PCBs, there's some, been some productive activity. 
the Toxic Substance Control Act from 1976 outlawed the manufacture of PCBs. It didn't totally outlaw, outlawed the use because it said in these closed uses of transformers and capacitors, since they were all contained, you didn't have to replace them. What's happened over the meantime is that they've all been replaced and they leak and they burn. Uh, we had the episode in the early 1980s of the fire in the Binghamton State Office building that spewed PCBs and, and furans all over the place. Uh, so that really hasn't helped all that much, but at least stopped manufacture. Then we had the Superfund Act that came out in, what, the early 80s, following Love Canal. And that created the principle that the polluter pays for the cleanup. And that's been very positive. And that's why General Electric had to uh, dredge the Hudson River, dredge the upper Hudson. But unfortunately, it's left the Hudson still highly contaminated with PCBs all the way down to Manhattan. What government has not been able to do has to provide any compensation for people that are harmed. Now, the third thing you can do is what you guys all do, and that's advocacy. And these government actions that have occurred, while they may not be totally adequate, would not have happened without pressure from, from groups like all, all those that all of you represent. Uh, because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And without people getting angry and raising their voices and saying, this is just unacceptable, uh, nothing else happens. But finally, the, the fourth way, and this leads to the predicament I got in, is litigation. And as I've said, nothing of these first three ways, not the research, not the government actions, not the advocacy, brings any relief to the people that are harmed by the exposure. They are focused in trying to reduce exposure, and that's a good thing. But for the people that develop cancer because of their exposure to PCBs, it doesn't help that. Now, I got involved in PCB litigation in about 2000 in, Mon in Anniston, Alabama. And again, the reason that I was looked to for providing expert witness was because I had so many publications from my own studies and those of my close colleagues showing how dangerous these chemicals were. And that uh, allowed me to have more credibility in terms of, of testifying to a jury about the harm that these chemicals cause than most other scientists. And I've continued to do that. I think at the present time, the last time I counted, I'm an expert witness in seven different cases all against Monsanto for harm to PCBs. <laughs> there was a settlement in one of these cases before I had to testify. The state of Oregon sued Monsanto for contamination of the waters of the state of Oregon. Monsanto settled to the tune of $698 million in the middle of December. The Mohawks are suing Monsanto for diseases that the people at Akwesasne have and for the contamination, really, of their culture, of, their, of the water, of the sediment, of the soil, of the air. And that suit will be uh, brought in St. Louis, Missouri, the hometown of Monsanto, which may not be a good thing for getting a uh, impartial jury, but that will be, uh, I'm scheduled to testify in that case on the 31st of March. They are seeking $1.3 billion from Monsanto. Do you begin to get a sense of why Monsanto may not like me? <laughs> uh, I've also testified in cases of a school, at a Sky Valley School in Washington State, where uh, the first three cases that I was an expert in were settled for uh, a little more than $600,000, starting with four teachers and then two families with children in the school. Now, in that school, PCBs were used as caulking, 
And the old fluorescent lights that hadn't been replaced have a ballast. And that ballast is critical for the operation of the fluorescent lights. Those ballasts used to be filled with PCBs. I've been involved in the situation in New York City schools where 600 schools in New York City still had old fluorescent ballasts. And the case of one student who had pure PCBs drop on her head in the class. This was under the, uh, the time of Mayor Bloomberg, who fought with EPA because he didn't want to replace those old ballasts, except over a period of 10 years, when finally EPA negotiated replacing all of them over a period of three years. Those of you like me who live in a house that was constructed before the late 1970s very likely have PCBs in your house. We're all exposed to them. So, you know, what can I say? There, there's almost no reasonable way to get PCBs out of your body. You can try by eating that non-absorbable fat, Olestra. They used to make uh, uh, potato chips with Olestra. Only problem, it causes violent diarrhea. <laughs> you lose all your fat-soluble vitamins. And so uh, there actually has been used in Anniston, Alabama, and it's been used for the president of Ukraine that was poisoned with dioxins. And there was a guy in Austria that tried to kill his wife by feeding her dioxins. Uh, it, it can reduce your body burden of PCBs, but it's not a very realistic treatment. So the, the issue, again, is that people that are exposed to these chemicals that are developing disease deserve someone to stand up to them and say, Monsanto should pay for that. A lot of academics look down their nose at people that serve as expert witnesses. I see this as part of my professional responsibility. <laughs> so I, I'm so grateful. I, I, I must thank a number of people. Uh, Bob Schofield, who's here, has been great, <laughs> great support keeping me in line. Without Brendan Lyons and the front pages in the Times Union, most of you wouldn't have known about what I was going through. I was, uh, I was ordered at the time that I was put on alternate assignment to not talk with anybody, including my students, nobody at the university. And I thought this was going to be over in a couple weeks. But that's why it took so long, because I didn't, I mean, I was certainly in touch with Bob before that. But only when it just seemed that this was never going to end, did Bob and I meet with Brendan Lyons, and he picked up the ball and, and wrote the papers. Now, even that didn't cause U Albany to do anything. And I'm so grateful, Judith said she happened to meet the chancellor. She stalked the chancellor <laughs> and told him, you know, you got to get your act together. SUNY Albany is making the whole SUNY system look bad. I got wonderful help from Pat Fahey, our, our congressperson. <laughs> and again, she didn't bother to go to the president of U Albany. She went directly to the chancellor's office. And uh, we had wonderful help from Vice Chancellor Rosenbaum who brought Bob and me, SUNY Albany lawyers, cent central lawyers, to a meeting at SUNY Central at 3 p.m. in one afternoon. And uh, uh, Ian Rosenbaum said to us, you're going to come to an agreement, and you're not going to leave here. You're not going to eat. You're not going to sleep until you come to agreement. And about 9 o'clock, when we were all hungry and tired, we came to an agreement. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful. Uh, Liz Kruger was in a position meeting with the chancellor on the SUNY-wide budget the day after we talked with her. And I don't know if she had to, but she was ready to threaten the whole SUNY budget if something didn't happen here. So incredible support from, from the legislature. And then the way Ju uh, Judith just organizes things. And Rebecca was behind that as well. And all of you, in incredible that you could develop 2,000 signatures. And I was looking at the list. There were signatures from Australia, from Vietnam, from Iraq, 
from Uganda wasn't just capital district. And a remarkable job, and I thank you so much. So I thank all of you for, for all you've done. And then uh, Doug and Patty, which has already been mentioned, uh, put up the website. Uh, I feel like I don't deserve all of the focus, but the focus belongs on those people that try to fight against industrial powers. Uh, you know, in my office, which I now can go back to, I have a folder headed What Monsanto Knew. One of those documents talking about the findings of the distrib distribution of PCBs and what Monsanto knew about their hazardous health effects starts out, we need to preserve our market share and our income from sale of PCBs. Now, anybody that causes a product that harms people should be liable for that. But anybody that makes a product that they know causes human health hazards and continues to manufacture it and continues to lie about whether it's toxic or not, that is absolutely inexcusable. So thank you again. It's a great pleasure, and I couldn't be more grateful and more humbled by your attention. deserved standing ovation. Thank you, David. Um, I want to thank Steve Pierce and Brandon Miller for everything in the entire world. And we're going to give you a short moment um, to, to say a comment. Um, KP, I'm sorry, Kristen Holler is the new executive director, and she's going to scoot around the room and you can speak for 15 seconds because you're standing in the way of food. And uh, before we do that, and it really is impossible to thank everyone, so I want you to tap the shoulders of the person in front of you, just thanking them, uh, pat on the back. And sorry, people in the back row, you get nothing. Pat on the back. So raise your hand if you would want to say a very, very brief statement, and um, Kristen will come to you. And then we're going to eat. No pressure. Back in the corner. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, my name is Tambalebi, PhD student for Dr. Carpenter. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for the good fight. We were direct victims of what happened. But now that you can come to the office, like, it's a relief for us. So thank you very much. And Dr. Kameta, thank you for the good fight. And thank you for the award for good trouble. Thank you, Jamba. Let me ask a question for you. Uh, do you have or envision uh, a, a larger number of uh, expert witnesses as yourself? Or have you been able to organize such a thing so that your work can continue far into the future, even though you might not be directly involved, I guess you could say? Well, there certainly are, are other individuals that I work with uh, closely in many of these different cases, uh, people that feel like I do. Uh, there aren't many expert witnesses that don't take money themselves. And that's been one of the reasons why uh, the juries like me, in addition to the fact that I have done research personally. But uh, there are... You know, there are expert witnesses of two sides. There's one group that are always on the industry side that make a lot of money doing that. And then there's the other group that are primarily people from academic institutions that are researchers that are trying to defend the people that are harmed. Great. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Claire Barnett with the Healthy Schools Network. And thank you so much for all the work that you do. You're a great board member and an inspiration to the rest of our board members. And I'm so glad you were out in Ohio. The red flag for us is when the railroad gave the local school district $300,000 because they couldn't play on their fields. What a red flag. Thanks so much, David.
Thank you, Claire. I'm also the treasurer of the Healthy Schools Network, which is a very easy job because we don't have very much money. <laughs> that can change. <laughs> I just wish there were so many more scientists who believed, as you kept saying, that their job was to help people rather than to write articles that other scientists read. But I also want to ask, were there any, given the settlement, are there any restrictions or are you back completely with all the rights that you ever had? Well, I, I'm back with the rights that I have and presumably that other faculty have. I am not precluded from doing expert witness work. Uh, I am precluded from using the funds directly to support students. And uh, I'm working with Robert on trying to find ways when I can do that. Uh, I've been told very clearly I'm not to use university resources for anything related to expert witness work. I find that uh, very difficult because I consider it part of my job. And if I were pocketing all the money, that's one thing. But So it isn't that there are no restrictions, but uh, you know the people that have really suffered all this through this uh, I can't really complain for myself in, in a lot of ways. I got full salary. I was told I couldn't teach. I couldn't serve on committees, which of course is the thing faculty <laughs> really like to do. And I couldn't go to my office. Initially, I couldn't even talk to my students. But since I had eight PhD students and no one else wanted to take them up, that, was, that provision was, uh, was changed shortly. I still couldn't go to the office, but they could come to my house, I could Zoom with them, I could email with them, I could phone with them. But they're the ones that really suffered. Uh, I must say, in terms of scientific productivity, when you sit at home all day, uh, I think I was probably more productive because I didn't have any interruptions, the interruptions being the good interruptions of teaching and, and committee work and mentoring students. So uh, I'm very happy with the resolution we have. Some of the things are irritating, but uh, as, uh, as Bob told me at one point, uh, with SUNY Central behind me, uh, I'm, I'm probably in a pretty good position for continuing to do my thing for as long as I want to. The initial event, when I was called into the Human Resources office was they asked me to assign a paper that said I retire immediately and I won't sue the university for age discrimination. <laughs> well, I'm obviously old and older than I need to be to retire, but no one's going to force me to retire under those circumstances. <laughs> and I'm going to continue. Oh my goodness, we learn something new every day. You bury the lead. <laughs> Um, we have time for one more question or comment. David, um, my name is Jeff Terenzelli. Hello, everybody else. Visiting today from Potsdam, New York, and I've had the pleasure to uh, not only work with David, but travel with Molly and Zach to Alaska, where we were working <laughs> in Norton Sound. And I just wanted to uh, say hello and also let everybody know that uh, David Carpenter has worked an awful lot in Alaska on similar issues mm -hmm. and environmental justice. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Good to see you. I didn't okay. have time to talk about that. But Next time, Alaska. So we're gonna wrap up. Food is waiting. We'll be here if you wanna come up and talk, but this concludes our program and congratulations to Dr. Carpenter for making good trouble. Oh, oh, wonderful. Hey, it's heavy. It's very heavy. Oh, that's wonderful. Give her the plaque. Thank you so much.